Okay, this is just a quick introduction to some work I'm doing. Uh, as I've said to a few people, I'm really just doing the last step in a mile long journey. So this, uh, what I'll be showing you is a system for creating visual effects using Haskell uh, in a very declarative style. And it's called PlaySpace. The language that you write in is called Shady. And I'll start with this quote from Connell Elliott, who basically did the bulk of this work, which is that beautiful images may be formed with beautiful programs. I think very much when I look at a lot of great visual effects, when I dig up the source code, I just get pages and pages of really imperative stuff that's very hard to understand. It produces a beautiful effect, but that seems to be the state of the art for producing visual effects at the moment. And there are a few exceptions, naturally. But I still say that's the state of play. So uh, Connell Elliott did some work long, uh, I guess he started this work back in the late 90s and has been doing it right up till now. Took a brief hiatus in the middle of the noughties on how to produce nice effects using declarative languages. Um, he's also worked with a few other people. I don't know how to pronounce all of their names. Uh, Sigbjorn Finn and I think it's Uche de Moor and, and, and now me. but my contribution is probably the smallest of all of them. Uh, I'll just go through a history of the kinds of languages he was looking at. The first one was Pan, and many of you have probably heard of this one. It was basically just a language for creating 2D images, which were resolution independent, and also animations, which were interactive. So there were user interface items, such as sliders and buttons and so on, checkboxes, etc., which you could interact with and change the uh, images in real time. And this resulted in um, some work. I, I'm not sure that the idea of an embedded domain-specific compiler was new, that they discovered it, but they certainly uh, used the approach to good effect. Um, and I'll talk about that later in this talk, when I get to talking about code generation. And then Connell, while he was still at Microsoft, started working on a system called Vertigo. And this was inspired by a shady shader language in something called RenderMan, which I actually haven't had too much of a look at. Um, and I would say that this is the predecessor to Shady, which is the language we're using in the PlaySpace system. And um, it generated code for graphics cards directly. This was before CUDA, I believe, and before OpenCL. Uh, and the compiler was inspired by PANS. And then, eventually, along came Shady, which instead of generating instructions directly for a GPU, targets something called GLSL, which is the OpenGL shader language. This is much easier to do. Uh, and one reason for this is that register allocation was quite hard in Vertigo. So what I'll... Was hard in, in Vertigo, but in Shady it's not, because it targets another language called GLSL, which has variables, and then it compiles down to something, and that also does the register. The code that I'm producing is actually GLSL. Oh, well, for Vertigo, but I don't know anything about Vertigo. I've just read the paper on it. Yeah. But it has real Um, Yeah, absolutely. Well, at least that was the programming model. And the, uh, I mean, I'm not 100% sure since, since I haven't programmed in Vertigo, but there was a section devoted in the paper to register allocation and how to make sure that they don't spill too often. Yeah. OK, so now I'll go into the basic concepts behind the shady language. And I think you should all be able to follow along. If you're not, please ask questions. Uh, I'm not expecting to lose anyone on this. So the idea of images in this language is that they're resolution independent. So instead of storing them as bitmaps, we store them as pure functions from uh, continuous Cartesian coordinates to colors, OK? So that's R squared, um, meaning the real numbers in two dimensions, OK? And you'll notice that I use the American spelling because it wasn't my code originally, and I just have to stick to the convention. I guess that makes you happy, Paul. <laughs> uh, 
So the, idea, the great thing about resolution independent images is that you can sample at any resolution. Well, close enough to the within the limits of floating point mathematics. And you can pan and zoom as much as you want. So if you've got a circle defined as you know all points less than x squared plus y squared are colored one color and otherwise it's not colored anything, then as you zoom in on the edge of the circle, it should just stay smooth, which is not going to happen with a bitmap naturally. So that's one nice thing about resolution independent images. Very simple idea. So here's an example of that. Uh, let's say that checker is a function from a pair of doubles to a bool. Okay, so it's not an image because it's just producing a true or false thing. And we just say that if we add the floor of x and the floor of y and then take the modu modulus of that, or we take it modulo 2 and check whether that's equal to 0, then uh, if that's true, then that's one of the squares. If it's false, it's the other square. Okay, and then we might have a function called boolean, which is a which is a combinator, and then we might say apply fmap to it, and that will turn it into an image. So it'll be something from a pair of doubles to a color, uh, where green and blue here are colors. Um, if you're wondering about the use of fmap here, this is kind of something you get used to once you've programmed in Haskell a lot and you've read things like the type class Opedia, which I do recommend you do <laughs> because you can learn a lot about um, code reuse, really. The type classes are, the, the standard type classes really are very useful and you see them all over the place in advanced Haskell programming. So in this case, this fmap happens to be the fmap on functions uh, on the function arrow, basically. So uh, the, the functor of, uh, of function. Maybe that's a little bit advanced, but. Then we can naturally extend this idea to animations. And they're simply from fun functions from time to images. So if image is double double to color, then and time is double, then type anim is time to image. Very simple stuff. But with Shady, it's not just 2D images. We also have this notion of surfaces. And uh, what we do for a surface is we take a flat mesh of triangles and we transform each vertex. So what we're essentially specifying is a mapping from uh, two dimensions to three dimensions. So the idea might be that you've got this uh, mesh which has the image of the checkerboard texture mapped on it. And we want to take each of the vertices in that and map it onto a sphere. And the way we might do this is say that here's our Cartesian coordinates in the plane, and then, and then transform it into this triple of uh, Cartesian coordinates in three dimensions. And that will work. That's, that's, that is actually the definition of sphere there. So we can also, well, there's also a notion of height fields in this language. And the idea here is that you're just changing the value of the z coordinate in a mesh. So mapping from two dimensional space to one dimensional space. And then what you can do is apply this HF surf combinator to the height field to turn it into a surface. And it really does have a very simple definition. So oh, I put that too high, didn't I? OK, so we've got the definition of a surface being something from double-double uh, to a triple of doubles, a height field from a pair of doubles to double, and then HF surf just takes something from a height surf to a surf. That should be height field, I'm sorry. And it really is as simple as that. That's, that's our definition there. So one thing we might want to do is define this uh, kind of egg crate height field. And we'll just say that that's equal to the cos of the x value times the sine of the y value on the mesh. And then we'll say that the egg crate is apply the HF surf combinator to the egg crate height field. And there it is in the background. And there it is in its full glory. It sure does, yeah. That's done with a bilinear um, interpolation between uh, different corner colors. So one of the corner colors is red, one's blue, one's green. I think I made the other one black, although then I made a time-varying one as well. 
and you know, it just basically, depending on the distance from the corner, chooses a blend of all those different colors. Fairly simple function to define as well. Okay, so another concept that we might want to look at is displacement. And this is actually how I produce the thing that you see sitting there in the background. Instead of displacing a flat plane to create a height field, what if we displace each point on an existing surface in the direction of its normal? So what if we displaced a sphere, each point on the sphere by the egg crate? Well, um, you basically get the thing that's sitting in the background there. So obviously if we've got normals, then uh, we're going to be, then calculus comes into this, right? Because we need to find tangents at surfaces and then work out things that are at 90 degrees to that. Um, this work alone led to a really great paper by Connell as well called Beautiful Differ Differentiation. I really urge you to read it. The way he programs is just extremely elegant, uh, but also does the job. So I, I definitely have a look at that. Um, it generalizes different automatic symbolic differentiation to arbitrary vector spaces and also does infinite towers of um, derivatives which are calculated on demand lazily. But please look at the paper for details. Um, I still need to study it in depth to fully understand it. Uh, but I'll just show you the basic idea behind this because it's kind of cute and I can show it in one slide. So the basic idea is to carry around a function and its derivative function in a data structure. And then when you compose two functions, you use rules like the um, that slide's not complete. It's meant to say using rules like the chain rule and the product rule. That's obviously hiding at the bottom of the screen. And no, not because the resolution's wrong on that, because somehow I, it fell off the bottom. Okay, so ah, this is wrong too. That's D standing for derivative, and this is meant to be DAA. And then the idea is that uh, a might be some numerical value. It might be, uh, well, well, let's say it's a float or a double. And then for each, if you have an instance of num a, then you also have an instance of num derivative a. And this is really nice. So basically what you have here is some data structure which is containing a, f a function and a function which is also its derivative. Or it might be a value because uh, derivatives could be values. And the same here. And when you add two, two of these things together, what you get is a new derivative value where, uh, well, you've, sim you've simply added the two things together here. And you've also added together the two derivatives. But it's really nice for the product case because here, for its derivative, you've got the product rule applied. It's straight calculus from high school. And here, uh, sine, you can see that you're actually applying the chain rule. So we know that the derivative of, of, of sine of x is equal to cos of x and also times the derivative of x. So, okay, I didn't explain that the prime means the first derivative of, but I think that's fairly standard notation, just making clear, making that clear. And we also have one for log here as well. And there's obviously lots of other examples. So if you just define things that way, then um, what you do get basically is automatic symbolic differentiation for free, and then you can calculate the normals of things. Okay, so now a word on yes, yeah. Okay. So function types become a, a tuple of an original function and then the function that works in parallel. Okay. Here you have a tuple of the original value and then the derivative of the value. Yes. I wonder if there's any other systems which do the same sort of thing because like here you're applying mm. plus. You're operating on the, the original thing and then the same value in a different space. Yeah, absolutely. I think this could be a generally applicable technique, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So you're working on something in a different domain at the same time. Do you know of any other systems which do that? 
I don't know, but now I know of one more because you're doing it in Data Parallel Haskell. Yeah, surely. I, I'll have to look into that. Uh, it seems to me like a generally applicable technique. Yeah, absolutely. As long as there's a, always a correspondence between the two things, then I think this should always be possible. I'll have a look into that. I'll keep an eye out for it. Are these? I wouldn't know. Yeah, I know, yes, but I don't actually know what a co-monad is. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, right, okay. So, yeah, because you can always throw away that extra information to get back to the original. Yes, I know. I, mean, I remember when I learned co-recursive just meant a recursive function without a base case. <laughs> but, well, that's the way I think of it because... <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I suppose. Yeah, I, I do imagine if I bothered to learn uh, all the algebra, then uh, all, all these interesting algebras, then I'd find there would be all sorts of correspondences. And, and you know, it is something I plan to do over the course of my rest, the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about GLSL. Uh, so it has a C-like syntax, probably just because people care so much about syntax and for no really good reason, because it's quite a, it's fairly, it's fairly declarative, the language, it's mainly expressions. There are variables, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty certain you could transform all the programs into something declarative. Okay, so... Um, it consists of fragment and vertex shaders. And fragment shaders basically correspond to images in our language, shady, and vertex shaders correspond to surfaces. So the idea is that with vertex shaders, it takes the vertices in a mesh and then somehow transforms them. And with fragment shaders, it'll take a triangle and color it some color. Okay, so vertex shaders set something called GL position and fragment shaders set something called GL frag color if you're familiar with OpenGL. Otherwise, ignore safely. Vertex shaders can pass variables to fragment shaders with something called varying variables. They're just a way of declaring things. And then shaders are the fragment shaders, I should say. Sorry, the vertex shaders. Oh, I think, no, both of them can receive variables from the environment. They receive constant values via a WebGL API. So basically, you've got a program in JavaScript and then create some data structure and then say, can I please assign this object to this thing in this fragment shader or vertex shader, which is defined, uh, declared with uniform something. It's really quite straightforward stuff. But just to give you an idea of what one of these programs looks like, uh, it'll sit in your HTML between a pair of script tags. So it's kind of cool to see some code that's not JavaScript sitting in between a pair of script tags. Absolutely. Yeah. It will as long as you've got some accompanying JavaScript code which sets up all the WebGL stuff first. And it will run. Yes, I'll be showing that later. Uh, no, that's not actually. That's just some other crap I left out. No, this is this sits in your HTML, and then you need to have another script, pair, uh, another script which is JavaScript, which initializes um, an OpenGL canvas or a WebGL canvas, I should call it, and then does a whole bunch of things. You know, sets your perspective matrix and clears the screen and whole set. Um, I think it's a separate. I don't think it's part of HTML5, but it's a separate standard which a bunch of browsers are starting to implement. It's, get, it's pretty exciting. Oh, fantastic. Well, 
Google had it first. I mean, Chrome had it first, basically, and then Firefox caught up really quickly in Safari just recently. I don't know about Internet Explorer. I think they're going to leave it alone. We'll see. Opera's probably got it as well, maybe, in the works. I don't know. I haven't used Opera lately. Anyway, uh, there's not too much interesting here. As I said, there's these uniform variables, which that's how you receive constants from um, your JavaScript code. And then you have these varying things, which are actually a way of passing things in between the two shaders. And then you basically have a uh, bunch of uh, variable declarations here. You'll notice that vectors are primitive. So you've got two vectors, three vectors, four vectors. I think that's it. And you can add them together, and it'll do them properly. So it's overloaded the plus syntax so that if you add two, four vectors, it adds up all the components of it. I think it can do dot products and stuff like that as well. I don't. So you can write your own shaders in this language, but the idea is this is pretty low level. We don't want to do that. Why not have a high level Haskell library that translates into this code? Okay, so code generation. So now this is where I say, what a twist. Actually, those expressions I showed you before, they weren't legitimate. Those weren't the real functions we're using. We're actually working on uh, abstract syntax trees the whole time. So when you're actually writing your programs, you're actually building up ASTs instead. And then they're turned in, they're used as the input into a code generator, which pr produces the GLSL code. Pretty standard technique. Uh, as I said, that uh, was introduced in PAN. Well, that's the first place I saw it. I'm sure people were doing it before then. They could also call this a deep embedding. They got this idea between shallow embeddings and deep embeddings. Shallow embeddings when you reuse the host language, i.e. Um, terms in the target language are terms in the host language. Uh, whereas in the deep embedding, that's not the case. Terms in the target language are actually data structures, which you then write a code generator for. It has its own problems. I've been working on Accelerate a lot, which is a language for doing array computations on GPUs. And so, you know, there's problems with it. Uh, it's a pretty elegant technique, but you can get annoying things like loss of sharing and heap, and then you have to, d you have to eliminate common sub-expressions as well. And that's a whole talk in itself. I'm not going to talk about it uh, tonight. So onto the website. Uh, it's, base, it's programmed in Yasod, which is a pretty decent uh, web framework as far as I'm concerned, if, uh, because I think it's really focused on expressivity. If I, I, I look at, um, what's the other one called? Snap. And Snap's still very much messing around in the let's get the web server, you know, let's, let, let's, let's write a fast web server and let's deal with all the low level stuff, which is cool. But I like the fact that your sod's kind of going, well, let's think about type safe URLs and string interpolation and doing things in a principled manner. Uh, let's, you know, let's focus on uh, high level libraries that are going to make people more productive in writing websites. And I found that after programming in Ruby on Rails, your sod is not quite as easy to use, but certainly a whole lot more safe and it's easier to maintain the code. That's just my experience. I haven't used Snap yet, but it doesn't seem like it's fully there yet. We also use Don Stewart's plugins library. The reason for this is naturally that um, you're entering code into this website and then that has to be compiled. So I compile that with GHC behind the scenes and then load the, ef the effect. Uh, well, I load the com yeah, basically load the effect in and then run the compiler over it to generate some GLSL, which I then substitute into HTML pages. Like, ah, yes. Yeah, that's something I'm going to have to look at. I have to say I haven't given it any thought whatsoever so far. But if this is going to be a production level thing, yes, I'm going to have to look into Safe Haskell. It's a, it's a good project that I should have looked at already. Uh, yeah, there's, I mean, yes, we've got to think about what sort of things might be possible. Uh, one thing, you can definitely write a program which doesn't terminate and it um, sucks up all the resources of the server. That's something I haven't even looked at yet. I've got it in my to-do list. Kill programs that have been going <laughs> for longer than 10 seconds. Do you have your server running on a public unit right now? Yeah, it's on AWS, actually. <laughs> <laughs> 
You're going to bring down. You're going to bring down a micro instance. <laughs> yeah, no, no, limited effects there. Uh, yeah. Also, I've had to learn a lot of WebGL, which is kind of an annoying. You know, uh, you get one thing wrong, and you just get a black screen. One thing wrong. So that's pretty standard in OpenGL programming as well. Okay. Uh, there's some to dos. Um, one thing it doesn't have at the moment is interactivity on the effects. And I really want that. So you can have sliders which change various aspects of uh, the effect. Uh, yeah, I haven't got proper authentication. I'm thinking maybe it would be cool to have a redevelop print loop. Uh, I don't know exactly how I'm going to do that, but it, you know, sending code across the network and having individual expressions evaluated in the result return, that would be kind of cool. I'd, I'd like to see if that was possible. Into JavaScript, and then what it works with the canvas? So, so you go, you go to his website yeah. and you get a window where you yeah. have code. You can paste in Haskell code, yeah. which has, it generates the gloss uh, picture structure, and then you click run down the bottom. I think it, it takes the picture structure and then evaluates it in JavaScript and then takes back the, the window where you can see the picture. Right, right. Okay. So you can see all his stuff. Yeah, that sounds kind of interesting. Because the, the code is not editor. So it has syntax highlighting. That's so in my list of to dos as well. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So, where, what's this guy's name again? Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Yes, that's, that would be really cool. I'm sure Connell would be really into that as well. Uh, it sounds very much like what Paul Hudak, or however you say his name, uh, sounds very much like what he was trying to achieve with his book, The Haskell School of Expression. Yeah, so it's great to see that. See, I, this is what I find so exciting about this, is that there's no installation involved. People just go to a website. And that's really cool. You know, browsers are the, the new operating systems, <laughs> really. So uh, yeah, the last thing is to get rotation and zooming working properly because at the moment when I do rotation, it rotates the camera rather than the object. Uh, so the light source is also rotated at the same time. It's kind of annoying. And I don't really want that. This is uh, live at the moment, so you can have a look. But I'm also going to show you a local demo. Uh, cool. Uh, So there we go. So that's, my, that's the effect that I had. Uh, I just made that last night. And that was done by, as I said, displacing every point on a sphere by the egg crate height, height field. But I think the light sta source is static. But anyway, I can also rotate these things. Like I can use WASD to sort of spin it around, and uh, as I yeah anyway, <laughs> maybe I should show it in this one. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So what I'll do now is log in, so that I can actually edit it. At the moment, you just enter a it's a dummy login. And then I'll edit this, and it brings up a little Haskell window. And you can see it's two lines of code. Uh, you define a surface and an image. And you know, secretly, behind the scenes, all this does is like put it into a template somewhere. 
in the middle of a where expression, actually, a where clause. But yeah. Uh, so what I'm doing here is this is a function, t is for time. And then what I do is I rotate about the y, z axis. And I also rotate about the x, y axis. Oh, sorry, I mean, not axis, plane. OK. Uh, and then I've got a few little compositions in here that really all I do is have the effect of zooming in or zooming out, OK? Because I'm just taking input coordinates and then dividing by two. Everything's very, very overloaded in this language. So that divide is actually dividing a whole vector, everything in a vector by two, just by overloading the divide symbol on, or divide operation on vectors. And uh, then we have the, the code here, displace sphere 2. There's various different spheres. There's different ways of mapping a plane onto a sphere. Uh, and, but here uh, I've got another function, which is basically the egg crate, except that um, I'm varying its height dependent on time as well by composing it with a function. Um, so you'll see it's kind of pulsating based on time. And then the image which we map to it is simply a bilinear interpolation between red, blue, green, and black. And that's, that's that, that example. So, you know, I mean, I can get in here and I can change various things. Uh, maybe I want to make it um, a bit more spiky or something. And uh, sorry, that's not the exact opposite. Right. So you can play around with things like that. But it's kind of annoying that I have to do that with the code. Uh, it'd be nicer if there was a slider or something that I could just change that, those things. But as you can see, it's, it's fast. And the compiler's fast and the effects are fast. <coughs> because they're running on your GPU and GLSL, well, basically, graphics cards naturally, or GPUs naturally lend themselves to being the targets of functional languages. So yeah, that's basically it. I hope to have more information for you as, as, as time progresses. All right, done. Any questions?